So nice to meet you and welcome to the talk in your mental compression. So just a quick overview of the agenda and the idea is that first I'm just going to be talking a little bit about who I am, just so that we can kind of connect. Um, then I'll give you an overview of what's the talk going to be about. Then we move on to the content and then we'll have a Q&A session. So about me, as Swamo said, I'm a machine learning engineer. Uh, I'm a tech here at Factory. I've been here since the very start. Um, I have um, uh, over six years of experience in different topics in data science, machine learning, and mostly natural language processing. And I'm currently being more interested in terms of in topics of in, in bioinformatics. Uh, in terms of personal things, well, I enjoy reading, uh, playing piano, and going to dine, to dine with my friends. If you want to connect, here's my LinkedIn. So go ahead. And overview of the talk is we will see three main things. The first one is what is compression and why do you use it? I'll tell you my personal story with compression. How did I get to understand and need this kind of technology? And then we'll move on to see in action three different types of compression techniques and how do they compare to uncompressed models. Now, the reasons of why you want to do compressions, there are a lot. There, I just listed here a few of them. Um, one is that you get massive returns, as you will see soon, for a very little cost. Uh, most of the business problems that we usually work with could definitely benefit from compression. So it's definitely a useful skill to have. It allows you to not require any GPUs to efficiently deploy any of your machine learning models. And you can have very, very low latency in CPU. This is important because it allows you to have modern applications that use many different uh, machine learning models under the hood. And you will be able to use all of these things without incurring in very, very, very long times. So, um, and finally, if what you're interested in is like the domain of TinyML and you want to actually deploy these kind of deep learning models into smaller devices, then compression is a must. Like that no, no longer is a uh, nice to have. Now, initially, let's start by defining what compression is. And in general, it's any technique that allows you to reduce the neural, the neural network size or improve the latency without having any significant loss in performance. And there are usually several, several techniques for this. Uh, the most known are knowledge distillation, graph optimization, quantization, weight pruning, and matrix factorization. We will focus on the first ones in this talk. And let's start now by telling you a little bit about what was my story with compression, and maybe see if maybe some of you get related to this idea. So initially, what I had to do is I had a business problem, which was a text classification problem, to be able to classify transaction texts into one of 300 categories. Something like you can see in here. So I have some transaction text, and it should go into one of these categories. In this case, it's technology peripherals. So as always, to start off, uh, I did some exploratory data analysis. I wanted to know what I was dealing with. And I found some interesting things. I found that the data was extremely noisy in the sense that many of those cases were just codes or numbers or things that didn't have a lot of information in the text itself. There were many cases that were mislabeled. So something that has nothing to do with hardware was classified as hardware. Uh, and also there were multiple languages. So not only English, uh, also Spanish, uh, Italian, uh, German, and many more. So the conclusion of this EDA was, okay, doesn't look like traditional ML, like some kind of natural language processing with machine learning model is going to work very well. So we'll probably have to move on to some of the transformer-based models. And that's what I did. I tried many different, different architectures, uh, many different training tricks. As you might expect, such noise in the data made it very hard to train. Uh, but at the end, we managed to get something pretty good. So it was time to deploy it. I built an API around it, built it out of a Docker container, and just tried to deploy it. What happened is the cluster in which the application was going to be deployed had no access to any GPUs. And we had to support over 10 million records uh, per month. So what ended up happening is that processing all of those requests, it ended up taking like 167 hours. So it's almost a week that you have to spend just processing this every month. And that starts to be very significant. So here is where I had to do some brainstorming and doing some research. And that's kind of what I found that the IBM that we had to follow was based on compression. So what I ended up, what I ended up doing is applying three of the techniques that we will be seeing today. Uh, the first one was knowledge installation. We will soon see all of these in more detail. I uh, exported uh, the graph to Onyx and then applied dynamic quantization. And all of these things managed to reduce the processing time down from 167 hours down to eight hours without losing any accuracy at all. So the idea of this is that maybe you can appreciate that this is actually very helpful and that you can apply this in so many cases to achieve 
probably even better the performance gains that I did here. So let's try to replicate something similar to what I did. So we will be dealing with a text classification data set. Here is one that's called a clink data set. Uh, essentially, it's 15,000 training samples. It's all balanced across 150 categories. And it has things like this. It's an intent detection data set. So the idea is that I give you some text and it has some categories associated to it. So we have for translation, we have for change in insurance, we have to improve credit score in total 150 categories. So it's basically a text classification problem with many of these things. What we want to see is what happens when we use a default model for this, and then what happens as we start applying some of these techniques. So let's start off by using a BERT model that was fine-tuned in this claim data set. We will use this as our, as our, as our baseline. Uh, against which we will compare all of the other models that we will be compressing. So the statistics in the use are it managed to get it manages to get an accuracy of 87%, uh, a total size of 418 uh, megabytes, and a latency of about 60 milliseconds. Now, before we move on, uh, I want to invite some of you to just think about follow your intuition. How how small do you think we can get without losing accuracy? What do you think we can get to be the final result in size? And what will be the final latency? And then as we move on, you can compare that to what your initial guesses were. So the first technique that we'll be analyzing here is something that is called knowledge oscillation. And before we get into the math and stuff like this, I want you to try to grasp the intuition behind it. And the idea is that in traditional learning, when you're just giving it the model, the samples and the correct label, you're only telling it if the answer it predicts is right or wrong. So that kind of misses the point in the sense of there's not much information contained in it. Like you only have that category itself. However, if we also train a model to replicate the output distribution of a larger model, then there's additional information that the model can use. And intuitively, this is kind of teaching the model, the smaller model, the way of uh, how the larger model thinks or the thought process behind it. But the general idea of distillation is that you're going to be transferring this knowledge from a large model that can have hundreds of millions of parameters, hopefully to a significantly smaller model that has a fraction of those parameters. And the general idea is that simply what you do is instead of only optimizing for the categorical cross entropy as you will traditionally do in a text classification problem, you also add a component that is some sort of similarity metric between the output distributions of the student and the output distributions of the teacher. And you basically just weigh them. When we apply this to our case, uh, we are going to be distilling the BERT based model into a smaller distilled BERT model. And we managed to get the following results. First, accuracy on change. You might even see a small increase in accuracy. This is explained because the model has less parameters and therefore is less prone to overfitting. Um, we managed also to cut down the size by 63%. And it's almost twice as fast. So you can see the comparison here. And um, just by applying this first technique, which uh, you have access to the code, I, it's the link is here in the slides, so you can access it freely and use it in your own problems. But by just applying this one technique, we have already managed to drop down the latency to half. Okay. So let's do a quick recap of what knowledge distillation is. The core idea is that you want to train a smaller model to approximate the output distributions of the larger model. And the kind of idea is that you're trying to encode this information that kind of means that is the thought process of the teacher. The result that we got is that it's 1.63 times smaller, almost twice as fast. And what I showed you here only applies for the case of supervised learning problems, because we're trying to model that log and output distribution. But with some adjustments, as we will see later in the slides, uh, we can be able to use this for unsupervised learning problems. So let's say that you're trying to do mask language modeling to train a generic smaller model to fine tune on different downstream tasks. Then you can do that um, as well with knowledge distillation. Juan, do you have any questions so far in the chat? No, so far we have no questions. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you can ask questions uh, both via Huva and via Zoom. Uh, and all of them uh, will be answered uh, either on these small breaks or at the end of the session. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Now let's move on to the second technique. This is what it's called graph optimization. And once again, I want you to keep the intuition. The idea is that whatever neural network you have, fundamentally, you can express it as a graph of its standard variations. And this is the core idea behind this. 
So you manage to translate this neural network that you have to a graph of these standardized operations, and then you can optimize the graph, both from an algorithmic perspective and also from a hardware perspective. So one of the optimizations that it normally does is something that is called operation fusion, which in general, the idea is that there are some things that can be executed together. So for instance, uh, if you're doing a matrix multiplication and then applying an activation function on top of it, uh, usually what you would do if you were optimizing the graph is that you will just be loading and unloading from the GPU every time you want to do that. And that kind of slows things down a little bit. What this does is basically just pack them together, execute them together, and this manages to get some nice optimizations. This also has an additional benefit, and is that once we manage to translate our model to this standard format, then you can load it back into any other framework of your choice. So what this means is that you can build a model, let's say in TensorFlow, export it to Onyx, which is the technology that we use to standardize this graph, and then load it back into PyTorch or vice versa. So it's a pretty powerful technology. When we applied to the distal bird model that we had previously, by the way, this doesn't require any additional training. It's literally just changing the format, and there are tools that help you with that, especially if you're using Hugging Face. Like there's a very tight integration between Hugging Face and Onyx. So it will be very easy to do this for any transformer based model. And here, we managed to get the exact same accuracy, the exact same size, but we managed to significantly uh, increase the performance. Now we have the model that is seven times faster than the original one. So we're doing pretty well. Once again, the intuition behind this is we want to transform this neural network into a graph of standard operations and then optimize them. Um, notice that whatever you do uh, for this case of graph optimization, the gains that you will get are highly dependent on the hardware you get, you get. So if you're going to be trying this on your own models in the future, just be aware that you might get better performance or worse performance. But in the, at the end of the day, you will get gains with respect to your original model. Now, the final technique that we're going to be discussing is quantization. And once again, the intuition in here is that multiplying integers is so much easier, both for humans and also for machines, than multiplying floats. So the core idea here is, what if, instead of just running these matrix multiplications as floats, we try somehow to convert those numbers to integers, do the matrix multiplication with integers, and then convert it back to the float. Will we lose a lot doing this? That's the general idea behind quantization, and it turns out that you really don't in most cases. So it's a very powerful technique because if you manage to quantize these models, and quantization here basically means going from float to integer, it's not only much faster thanks to the speed ups that you get in the matrix multiplication, but it's also a more, a more compact modeling disk because now some of those weights that you were originally representing as floats, they can now be represented as integers. When we apply this to our model, we managed to see that we get a total of three times a smaller model with respect to the original one, and now 10 times as fast. As you can see in the plot on the right, uh, we have in blue our base model, and then in yellow our first uh, model, model that, that was applied knowledge distillation on. Then when we apply the graph optimization with the green one, and finally when we apply the quantization, we get the red one. Some of you might wonder, why do you see some kind of a small accuracy boosting here? And it's there's an explanation behind it, and it's basically that, coincidentally, by doing this quantization, you manage to classify better some of those observations or, or some of those samples that were very close to the decision boundaries. So this is not always the case. Like You shouldn't expect that when you quantize a model, you will get a performance gain in terms of accuracy. You will definitely gain performances in terms of size and latency, but not necessarily in accuracy. This is just a coincidence in this case. And once again, if we recap what quantization is, is the general idea is to convert float to integer, do the matrix multiplication with integers, and then convert back to float. And these three techniques combined together just give us a total boost of a model, a model that is a third of the size of the original one and 10 times faster without losing any accuracy at all. There are also other types of quantization that I'm not covering here. Um, there are two main ones. One is called static quantization. It's faster, so you would get an even faster uh, inference, but it requires additional data to kind of fine tune this to the static quantization. And the last one is what is called quantization aware training. And it's basically just you train your model with the previous knowledge that it's going to be quantized. So it kind of learns some interesting things in here. The downside is that this 
Yeah. You will need to incorporate this in your training mechanism. So it's not like you can just apply it out of the box with a pre-trained model, as you can with dynamic quantization that I showed. The main takeaways of what we've seen so far is that we have three main techniques, uh, knowledge distillation, graph optimization, and dynamic quantization, that by no means are exclusive. You can use all of those three together. And the main idea is that I want you to recall those three intuitions. Where distillation is just about encoding somehow the thought process of the teacher in order to transfer more efficiently the knowledge into a smaller student. The graph optimization is just being able to see this deep learning net neural network as an optimizable bunch of operations, and you can just optimize that. And quantization is just some clever ideas to make use of the fact that matrix multi multiplication is about 100 times faster than float multiplication. Um, additionally, you should realize that by now, you really do not need GPUs to deploy these highly efficient models. We managed to deploy a great performance BERT-based model, huge transformer model, that managed to get a latency of 80 milliseconds, which is pretty good. Um, so with proper compression, you can get probably even smaller latencies. And seriously, just uh, you have access to this code. I try to make it very easy to use so that you can basically extend it and use it in your own applications. So please feel free to use the code in whatever personal models you have, in your work, in whatever you want. Juanjo, do you have any questions so far? Mm, yes, we have two questions and one on Hiva, which is, can you discuss some of the challenges or limitations of neural network compression and any potential solutions or directions for future research? Yeah, sure. So the main downside that you might see in terms of um, general techniques of, quant of compression is that in some cases, depending on the architecture, depending on the data set, depending on the actual problem that you have, you might get a significant degradation in performance. So this is like the main risk that you have. And what you do in these cases usually is try different approaches. Like you don't need, for example, to quantize. Maybe the issue was with the quantization, so you can get rid of that. The transformation to the RNX uh, shouldn't be a problem ever. Like you're not changing the model at all in here. And in terms of the distillation, you can try so many things. You could try maybe giving it a slightly bigger student. Maybe the student that you chose uh, wasn't expressive enough for the teacher. Uh, you can also optimize a lot of hyperparameters. So there's a lot of things that you can do. In terms of future research, uh, I'd say that there is one aspect of compression that is still uh, in heavy development and in heavy research. And it's something that I didn't mention before, uh, or sorry, that I didn't cover in the, in, the, in the slides, which is called pruning. So the idea of weight pruning is basically that there are some weights of the neural networks that are not very significant. So you can just get rid of those. Conceptually, that sounds really nice. Conceptually, it sounds like that will allow you to gain huge gains in terms of both performance and model size. But the issue is that the hardware that we currently have is not optimized to deal with these kinds of things because it will be in weird shapes and stuff like that. So people are actively trying to make this pruning technique uh, more viable and more usable from a hardware perspective. But in general, is that, yeah, I think that the next research direction is to build on top of that new compression technique, which will allow you to make smaller models. Um, and the reason is that basic quantization works really well, and there's been a lot of study in that. Distillation is also a very old idea that has been shown great results, and there are also many different types of knowledge distillation, as I will show you later. Uh, and well, graph optimization is just, yeah, that doesn't change anything in the model, it just makes it more efficient. I hope that answers the question. Okay, we are having more questions. Uh, I want to uh, do like a general announcement that we are going to answer the questions from Hugo first, then from uh, the Zoom Q&A, and then from the Zoom chat. So the next question is, does this affect interpretability? Hmm, that's a nice question. I mean, if, I mean, in general, you see the challenge that maybe deep learning models are difficult to interpret, but you have to remember something, and it's, we're not really changing anything fundamental here. We are just making a smaller model, okay? So kind of like the interface is the same. So if you manage to have a good explainability model on top of your original neural network, which is possible, there's been a lot of recent research to try to debunk the idea or the myth that deep neural networks are not interpretable. There's been some very, very interesting work in this area. Um, so if you manage to have interpretability on your original model, you should be able to have the exact same interpretability in this smaller model. 
Mm, good. Uh, we have another question. Um, today, Gladio claims to have increased the OpenAI Whisper model by uh, 1,200 times. Based on your experience, what do you think they may have done? There are so many things that could have, done, could have been done. I'm not sure if the answer lies directly through compression or if their answer lies more in terms of horizontal scaling of the application. So it's kind of like you have to think about this performance gains in two ways. You could just improve the performance gains by creating multiple replicas of your model and just running that in parallel. So that will work too. The issue is that that will be much more expensive to run. So the other option is that you have compression, where you have limited resources, where you only have access to one computer, one server, and you still want to do things very quickly. So there are many things. I would say that maybe, uh, given the infrastructure that they have and the complexity of the models that they have, they probably went more uh, through the path of horizontal scaling, but I really do not have an idea. I don't have that clear. Mm, fantastic. Um, Jose Julian asks, Probably the question is misplaced. What resources would you recommend to learn more, more about these compression algorithms and the differences they have? That's great. So what I would recommend is, especially if you are kind of trying to apply this to a natural language processing setting, the tight integration between hugging face and all of these compression methods, distillation, uh, compression, uh, graph optimization, uh, quantization, they are tightly integrated in Hugging Face and they have so many resources learned about it. So you can just visit the Hugging Face and you will see some of these parts that kind of deal with the issue of deploying models in production. And they will ha often have many different blogs and tutorials about all of these things. What I recommend is initially you have access to the code. So try it out in your own models, see the work in something that was not prepared in a very different data set, in a very different models try to analyze the code. That will give you like this starting baseline to have a general idea and a general understanding of how it works and how to implement it in your own code. And then move on to trying it to different things. Like try to find an example where it fails. Like try to find a data set or a model architecture or something that when you compress it, you manage to get very, very, very bad performance. And that will give you a great insight into in which cases will compression work, what do you need to adjust it and everything. But yeah, to start off, I would say, Take a look at the, at the code that is linked in this presentation and take a look at the hugging face documentation because there's a lot of things that you can search in there. Okay, uh, thank you, Juan. And uh, finally, uh, we have a question by Andres Felipe Zapata. In quantization process, I imagine that you specify how many decimals do you want to preserve transforming parameters into integral. What precision did you choose? Was it significant? That's a great question, actually. And that that is kind of the details that I left out of the slides in quantization. But now that we're talking about it, let's, let's go back to those details. So I never actually explained how do we actually do this transformation from float to integer. What we want to do is the following. We start off with the idea that weights in neural networks often are bounded to a very tight range, like let's say from minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.1. And the vast majority, like 99% of the weights in the neural network or in the layer that you're trying to quantize, fall within this range. What we want to do is that we, we want to be able to map that range to the range that is supported by integers. So it could be from 0 to 255 or from minus 127 to 128. And what we do in this case is just try to do this affine transformation in the sense that you can do just a linear transformation of the floats and just move it as you require to match the, the, the range that you're trying to move it to. So what ends up happening is that instead of actually specifying what precision do I want, I'm always going to be mapping it to integers. And there are three things that can happen. When I do this affine transformation, one thing is that some of those floats will correspond exactly to an integer and you can map back and forth between them. So there is no error in that quantization. Like it's exactly the same number, just a different representation of it. Second thing that can happen is the 1% of the weights that are not contained in a minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 range, those are going to be clamped to the lower or the upper bounds respectively. So you will be inducing a little bit of error in there. 
And the third thing that can happen is that the, the weight does fall within the range, but it does not fall exactly on one of the um, integers. So it falls maybe a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. And in this case, you approximate it to the closest integer. So that's kind of the general idea is that you do this affine transformation in which you just do a linear transformation and then adjust how to move it. And that basically yields you the quantization and that allows you to move back and forth. And the error induced by quantization is caused by those approximations, whether it's clamping at the edges or approximating to the nearest integers if you're inside. Hopefully that kind of answers the question. Okay, it if, seems like it did. Awesome. Um, currently we have no more questions. Okay. We have time for the final part in here, which is just in case that we didn't have enough time, I just wanted to give you the main content of the topics of compression. And now we can move on to some of the more interesting details, okay? So first thing that we might want to consider is the following problem. Imagine that you have a very, 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 very good teacher. Like it has, it's, if the correct classification, I mean, if it predicts the correct class, it predicts it with 99% accuracy. Remember that the idea of knowledge distillation is that we want to use the softmax distribution of the teacher to give more information that will be given by just saying, hey, this is the correct label. But if the teacher is always 99.999% sure of the, of, the, of the answer, then we really couldn't be able to do any kind of um, distillation here. So what we do for to solve this problem is something that is called the softmax temperature. And it's basically like, imagine that you have a candle and the candle is this first block that you have in here which would represent the softmax distribution of a very, very confident model. What we want to do is we want to melt it down. We want to try to make it a little bit more uniform without going too far, like in this case, but maybe something like this, something in which I can get a better sense of the relative distributions of the, of the other categories. Uh, this is done just by adding an additional parameter to the softmax function. And the general idea is that the more you increase the temperature, the more the softmax is going to melt. So it's going to be a little bit more uniform. And this helps a lot. This is super important when you're dealing with distillation. And it's in fact, one of the most important hyperparameters to optimize if you are doing this distillation. Second thing that you might want to keep into, uh, into consideration when doing knowledge distillation is how to choose the students. Okay? So this is not that trivial. It's not like you can just choose any student model and it will work. What I would recommend is Choose the same architecture, but with less parameters. And you can chop off parameters in the sense of you can reduce the intermediate size if you're dealing with a transformer-based model. You could reduce the number of layers. So instead of having, I don't know, 12 layers, you can make a model that only has six layers. Or you can reduce the hidden size dimension. So instead of working with 700 dimensional vectors, you can move that down to 200 vectors. Um, and this should most of the time work pretty well. So generally the idea is when you're doing the selection, just choose a student that has the same architecture of the teacher, just with a bunch less parameters. And finally, what I told you earlier about what I showed you in the terms of knowledge isolation, you should only apply to supervised learning. But what happens if you want to do this for unsupervised learning? Like you want to train a distilled generic model like that you can fine tune later to different tasks. The general idea is basically the same. You still have a base loss function, which in this case, you will change the categorical cross entropy for a masked language modeling loss in the case of natural language processing. And instead of comparing the softmax distributions of the outputs of the teacher and the student, what you want to do is compare the intermediate representations of the teacher and the student. So I don't know, you get some of those layers, some of the last layers representation, that's a vector in 700 dimensions. And what you want to do is try to minimize the distance between the vector that is produced by the teacher and the vector that is produced by the student. So this in general has the same effect of distilling the knowledge, but in an unsupervised way. And there are many, many, many more ways to do distillation. Uh, down here is a paper that explores a survey of it. So in case that you're curious to learn more about distillation, go ahead and take a look at the survey. It's pretty good. And that's all I have. I don't know if there are any additional questions. Mm, we have a, a question. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on compression for LLMs uh, like GPT-3 and text completion tasks as opposed to classification tasks? 
Well, I guess, uh, I mean, first of all, regarding the large language models, the other the chat GPT and GPT-3 and all of these models are the same thing that we saw in here, just maybe a little bit bigger or with a little bit of adjustments in the architecture, but they're at the end of the day, just transformer-based models. But it's tricky because when you're dealing with language modeling, you do require very high capacity. So you require a lot of parameters to try to understand the different semantics and syntax and stuff like this. So I haven't tried this directly in the context of, let's say, text generation. But I mean, it's something that we can definitely do. Like you can go ahead and pick up one of your, you can use GPT-3 if you have enough uh, memory to train it or to fine tune the distillation on. Um, or you can just go ahead and use one of the bird-based models, which you can also use for language generation for text completion, and try to apply these techniques and see if you can get the same results of chat of text generation with the distilled model. I'm kind of skeptical, but I haven't tried it, so anything can happen. This is deep learning, so anything can happen. Um, so I would invite you to, to try it out, and if it works, just let me know. Like that would that would be interesting. I think that it wouldn't work too well because then probably all of these huge language models would already be distilled, compressed, and optimized. And you don't really see that. You see that they are huge, huge, huge models. But I, definitely, I think that it's definitely worth a shot. All right. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, we have another question from Mateo. How sensitive is the knowledge distillation protocol to catastrophic forgetting of the student model? You, you're really not inducing any catastrophic forgetting in the student because the student is going to be initialized from scratch. So, well, it can be initialized from a pre-trained thing, but what you want to do is that you want the student to learn essentially the same parameters or the same logic of the teacher, but in a much more efficient representation. So it's not like you're going to be losing the previous knowledge that the student had because you're just going to be replacing it all in. Mm, okay, good. Mm, I do not see any other questions uh, on any of the platforms. Uh, so mm, I think that means uh, that everything is clear. Uh, thank you very much, Juan, uh, for this talk. This was a, a really interesting topic. Um, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, on the chat, uh, I share the agenda. Uh, for the event, uh, make, be sure to check it out uh, to attend any other uh, talk uh, that ca catches your eye, that interests you. Uh, and goodbye, everybody. Uh, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.